Okay, a very warm welcome to one and all. Uh, my name is Vishwanath. I'm a faculty member here at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. I'm also one of the organizers of uh, this thing. So if you have any, uh, you know, logistical issues related questions and so on, please uh, feel free to contact me about them. So uh, maybe we'll get down to, to business right away. So as uh, I guess at least some of you have been here before and you sort of have an idea of what uh, you know the structure of the program is usually. Um, it's, it's, uh, this year again we have you know lectures on by various people, uh, including many of my colleagues, on uh, the core content of math as well as uh, a couple of uh, talks reflecting on the teaching of mathematics in in the classroom and so on, pedagogy or other issues that that arise. So I hope you will have uh, uh, a fruitful and enjoyable session. Okay, so uh, what I myself am going to start talking about is uh, calculus. So of course, uh, I guess you know it's one of the uh, prime topics as far as eleventh uh, and twelfth mathematics is concerned in schools. And uh, what I want to do is just, you know, have sort of a discussion about the various concepts that, that arise. So this is just a sort of informal discussion. So please don't treat it as a, a formal lecture or anything like that. So in particular, feel free to, to stop me and, you know, and give your comments or, or uh, you know, whatever else. Feel free to interrupt as many times as necessary. So. Uh, what I really wanted to talk about, start talking about, was this particular notion of limits. Okay, so of course, calculus is, uh, you know, limits is really the the prime concept which underlies all the the notions that one defines in calculus. So I specifically want to talk about uh, something which may not arise directly. Uh, in you know in most school syllabi, which is to talk about limits of sequences. So often, when you say limits, you're talking about you know a limit of a function as x f of x as uh, x approaches some value and so on. That's how we usually think of limits. But um, it, it's actually useful to think about you know what are called limits of sequences. So uh, what do I mean by this? So firstly, what is a sequence? A sequence is just a list of numbers. So a list of real numbers, a1, a2, a3, a4, dot, 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 an infinite list of numbers is what we usually call a sequence. Um, so the most obvious examples are, so you could take, for example, 1, half, 1 by 3, 1 by 4, and so on, right? So the nth term of this sequence is given by a formula. Right? In this case, what's the nth term? It's just 1 by n, right? So if this is the nth term, it's just given by 1 by n. So it's a sequence given by a simple formula. Now, uh, you could have other kinds of sequences. You know, not all sequences need to be given by, uh, you know, simple formulae like this. So anyway, we'll, we'll come back to those. And so specifically in this context, uh, if this is the sequence 1 by n, I want to ask, what happens to the sequence as n goes to infinity? So what's the limit of the nth term of the sequence, 1 by n, as n tends to infinity? So what's the answer? Zero. It's 0. Right? So what we mean, of course, is that the nth term, as n becomes larger and larger, it becomes closer and closer to 0. So I mean, I, I won't revisit this, this formal definition, but for now, we sort of know intuitively what the limit means. Now, let's take a second example. Let me take the sequence, which is uh, rational numbers. Okay. So, what's the nth term? It's n over n plus 1. And so, the limit of the nth term of the sequence as n goes to infinity one one undefined one 
right okay okay fine so another way of writing this is to say it is n over n plus 1 is you you could sort of add 1 and subtract 1 on the top write it as 1 minus 1 over n plus 1 if you wish right so the same thing if you wish in terms of trying to understand the behavior better it's this therefore that term 1 over n plus 1 goes to 0 so you know it goes to 1 and so on okay so that's another example so here's example 3 Suppose I want limit as n goes to infinity of n over n square plus 1. Okay, so what all these mean is, I mean, even though it, it seems to resemble a lot of the usual limits for functions, you know, if you are mentally thinking limit x goes to infinity x over x square plus 1, it's not quite the same thing. What we mean by this is you, you take the sequence. Okay, so if you wish I could do the following, I can say consider the sequence a n whose terms are defined by the formula n over n square plus 1. In other words, the first term is 1 over 1 square plus 1, second term is 2 over 2 square plus 1 and so on. So imagine having an infinite sequence whose terms are these rational numbers and the question is what do these terms become as n becomes very large? Yeah? Yes? Right, we'll come to that in a second. But for n tending to infinity, it's, it's sort of clear, right? So don't worry about, so okay, so what you mean, what do I mean by this? What is limit n tends to infinity? So infinity at the moment, think of it just as a, a convenient symbol to express the fact that as I, as I keep going further and further down the sequence, as I keep taking, you know, terms which are further down towards the end, what does the sequence approach? I'm sorry, what? So th those would be terms, so what do you understand by divergence or convergence? Yeah, right, okay. So in some sense, it's synonymous with the notion of limit. Yes, exactly. So I'm going to also throw those terms out, but at the moment, really limit and, you know, if the limit is some number, then you would say the sequence converges to that number. Yeah, it's just a, a rephrasing in some sense of, of the limit notion. Okay, so, so here's what I want to know. I mean, at the moment, without worrying too much about what infinity is and so on, limit n tends to infinity, you think of it as just a convenient way of saying, what happens to the terms as I keep going further and further to the right of the sequence, right? I keep looking at farther and farther terms, what number does it approach, right? That's intuitively what limit means. So what do you think happens to this sequence? Why? Denominator? Okay. Divide both numerator and denominator. So you need some ways of trying to understand what the behavior is. So one option is to do a similar thing. Divide both numerator and denominator by n. You will get 1 over n plus 1 by n. Right? So this is what it looks like. And if n is a very, very large number, then you can see that you know this is bigger than n. Right? So if you wish, this term is less than 1 by n because the denominator n plus 1 by n is bigger than n, so 1 over that the reciprocal will be less than 1 over n, right? So it's becoming very small, it's becoming smaller than 1 over n, so it must go to 0. So the limit of this sequence is in fact 0, okay? So we'll just throw uh, two more of these answers up on the board and we'll revisit them. Limit n tends to infinity of 2 power n. And I want to ask what's so consider the powers of 2 as your sequence, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. So what's the limit of that sequence as n goes to infinity? Yeah? Yes? What should I write there? Infinity? Any, any other ways of expressing this? Indeterminate, okay, let me write out various terms. So, 
in some sense, it's a, it's a gray area, if you wish, indeterminate. Okay, any other things you have come across or want to suggest? Not defined, okay, not defined. No, okay, no finite value. Any other phrases here? Doesn't exist. Does not exist, yeah. That's one of the favorites. We abbreviate it often to D and E, right? Does not exist. Okay, so that's, that's a large enough list of synonyms for now. So we, we'll come back and, and analyze what these are. Now what about this? So it's just a se sequence which is minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, and so on. Plus or minus one at every alternate step. So what's the limit? Plus or minus one? Like this? No, yes? Okay, what are other options? Okay, D and E, fine, does not exist. Anything else? Oscillating between plus one and minus one. But what is the limit if you were asked? I mean, oscillating and so on is some kind of description of behavior, right? But if you're asked, what is the limit? Okay, does not exist. That seems to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. No, no. N goes to infinity. See, the, like I said, this is this. I mean, I realize this notation is slightly confusing because it seems to suggest some kind of uh, thing with function. So uh, what I'm saying is, take the sequence a n whose terms are. 2 power n. In other words, write out the sequence 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm asking, in this sequence, what happens to the nth term as n goes to infinity? Right. So that n really shouldn't be thought of as, you know, like your variable in your function f of x. I'm just saying what happens as I go down the sequence. Right? This is fine so far. More or less agree with uh, whatever is up on the board. Okay, so let's revisit uh, these things now. So, at the moment, you know, we've written a bunch of bunch of answers for the limits. But so here's the question, however, if we had to formally define the limit, so if I give you a sequence a1, a2, a3, and so on, and you're asked to explain, what does it mean to say that the limit of this sequence is some given number? So for example, so let's ask the following question. So we leave some of these examples up on the board. So suppose I tell you the following statement, limit. So I'm given a sequence a n and I tell you that uh, the limit as n tends to infinity. So suppose you're given this, given the following fact, the limit of a n as n goes to infinity is zero. Yeah, I'm, gi I'm given some sequence a n for which I tell you the limit is 0. So what does it mean? Okay, the value becomes very, very small and approaches 0. Okay, so let me, let me write these things down. So uh, the value, the, the value of a n, right? I mean, a n essentially becomes small, very small approaches 0. Okay, any other way of thinking about what it means for the limit to be 0? The terms are around 0, okay. So each of these sorts of adjectives are, are very useful. Approaches is one of them. Around is another very good adjective. Uh, the terms by which you mean the values of a n, the terms are around 0. Anything else you might? Numerical value decreases. Numerical value decreases. Uh, what do you mean by numerical value? You mean absolute value. Is that what you mean by numerical value? Like if it becomes negative, you only want to take the positive part. Okay. So let me say the absolute value of a n 
decreases as n n becomes larger you mean so this this decreases as n gets larger and larger right okay that might be one way of thinking about it any the sequence is a convergent sequence what do you mean by that no but in some sense so like i said see you are now you have to define what converges means then see at the moment i am asking you what does it mean for the limit to be zero in some sense what you are doing is replacing that question by another equivalent question you are just saying you know this means that it converges to zero but then what does converges mean right so you realize the the thing you'll have to now define what converges means so converges is a synonym if you wish for limit instead of saying the limit is zero i can say the sequence converges to zero it's just a different language that's it sorry it gives a notion of plane because of around you mean in a two dimensional not necessarily uh, in some sense maybe that psychologically the the obvious thing that will come to mind but if you are on a line you can think of an interval like being around means you you lie in a small interval around that point Yes, yes, because we are only talking about functions of one variable in some sense. But if you looked at, for example, functions of two variables, three variables, and so on, you will have to look at exactly the sort of thing you said. You will have to look at, you know, by around you will mean sort of a maybe a circular, a disk around that point, and so on. Yeah, but for us, yeah, this is good enough. It's only on the line. So, any other ways of describing what it means? So, what? Yes. If you draw the graph of n a, okay. n is not here. Right. n approaches infinity. Yeah. n approaches to x axis. Right. That's just an axis you can draw. Okay. Fine. So you're saying let's think of this graphically. That's another way of thinking about the same thing. So you draw the graph. Except now, so it's like you can only uh, n is now only ranging over one, two, three, four, and so on. Only integer values. Okay, so for one, you it's sort of a, I mean it's not quite a continuous graph, but only a, a discrete set of points. You will draw for one, you will draw the point uh, whose y coordinate is a one. So imagine this is a one, first term, right? Second term could be this a two, is that right? That's what you want to. A three could be this, and so on. So what you're saying is, as n goes larger and larger, the height, the yeah, it it comes very close to the x-axis. the the heights of these things that you are drawing right these these vertical segments that's the value of an that's going to come closer and closer to the x axis yeah so it's a, some sort of discrete graph it's not quite a continuous graph you're just drawing a bunch of points but those points in some sense come close to touching whatever that word means so this is uh let me try to say this is not quite the graph but anyway maybe for want of better word the graph of n versus an comes close to right the x axis okay <laughs> okay <laughs> so i'll i'll come to that in a second so any other uh, ways of thinking about this okay so in some sense there is this whole notion of somehow closeness around approach and so on now let's try and you know at least among these let's choose a few so first thing uh, does it always need to happen that the sequence decreases suppose the limit is zero right so for instance the sequences we wrote were all 1 by for example 1 by n right so 1 by uh, i mean when it goes to 0 for instance we wrote the sequence 1 by n which decreases 1 half 1/3 1/4 and so on it decreases to 0 that's okay but is that always a necessity can you think of sequences which minus 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 half the whole power n okay how about that so imagine the sequence 
OK, maybe we'll, I'll erase these for now. So consider the sequence minus half the whole power n. So here is an example. Suppose my sequence is minus half the whole power n. So what does that mean? The terms are like these, minus half plus 1 by 4, minus 1 by 8, plus 1 by 16, and so on. Right? They alternate in sign. OK? Is this a counterexample? So he said the absolute value has to decrease, right? So I mean, the absolute value will, will still decrease in this case, because the absolute value is still only the plus times. But nevertheless, it, it illustrates an important point. The sequence itself need not decrease, OK? It could happen that the sequence sort of oscillates. So if, for example, if you imagine drawing the graph like we did there, it's the first term is minus half, second term is plus 1 by 4, third term is minus 1 by 8, plus 1 by 16, and so on. So they keep going on either side of the x-axis, they finally come closer and closer, right? But the sequence itself is not decreasing. It's still oscillating in some sense. It's like that sequence plus 1, minus 1. Can we talk about this sequence in that context? Which, which context? This sequence is not in that context. Which sequence? This minus half over x. Yes. Why, what do you mean by it's not in that context? It is, uh, it, its absolute value is in fact decreasing. That's what, is that what you mean? The absolute value, it's not a counterexample to that. The absolute value is in fact decreasing, right? So that will not give us a counterexample, but it, it, this is still not necessary. So let's try and come up with another example. This may not be true, that the C, if, if the limit is zero, it may not happen that the absolute value decreases, okay? So how do we manufacture sequences? Well, let's just do something for which this is false. So let's just, But it doesn't go to zero, no? Right. If you say sequence of zeros, then it's already, you know, it's decreasing because it's, well, it's, it's, it's constant in some sense. So the thing with sequence is the following. So how do you manufacture a sequence? So here's the question. I want an example. So let's write out what we want. Uh, question, find sequence a n. So sequence a n such that with the following properties that the limit is 0 as n goes to infinity, but the absolute value of an does not decrease. It's not a decreasing sequence. You can even find a sequence of positive terms which does this. So I don't even need you know, even assume positive terms if you want. So I want a sequence of positive terms. So imagine drawing a graph. Eventually, those terms must, you know, must go down to 0. But I don't want them to go down to 0 like this. They shouldn't keep decreasing all the way to 0. So how do you? 1 by? 1 by 2 the whole power n. You mean, instead of this, just put plus. So if you did this, then it is plus. So it's still decreasing, right? Half, one fourth, one eighth, and so on. Still a decreasing sequence. Any sequence? So what is it that you don't want? I mean, you don't want the graph, so-called graph, the discrete graph which joins these points. I don't want this to be a decreasing function, right? I don't want it to keep going down all the way. I want it to do other things. For example, maybe I want it to go down and then go up for some time, go down, go up for some time. Anything is fine. I'll take any answer. Right. Right. It doesn't actually go. So what, but what is your sequence? I'm a little confused. Sine of? Sine of x. But x, where, where is x? I want a sequence after all, right? I want a n. So what do you mean by saying I want sine x? Right? So in some sense, your intuition is however right. So what you want is the following. So think in terms of the graph. So the graph is a sort of powerful way of thinking. You want to say, 
you know, if I join my, my points that constitute my sequence, I sort of don't want the curve to keep going down, right? But so what would you want a curve? So what sort of curve would, would be, you know, something that you like? Maybe you will want, what if we, we say I want something like this? I want a curve which, so imagine these are the points I have. Maybe it does that. Maybe after a while it's decreasing, but initially it keeps doing a couple of jumps up and down. Right? Question is, can you manufacture a sequence like this? Okay. I'm not sure, but draw a parabola. Draw a parabola. Okay. Like uh, this origin as vertex, yeah. like this, yeah. okay? And you try to create a sequence ah. whose n values define values close to zero. Whose n values define values of x close yeah. to zero, okay? That, that part will be very close to zero. Yes, fine. But I don't want it to decrease also. It is not decreasing. So you try to take values close to both sides. Ah, you want something to come from here as well as from that. For example, I cut a line parallel to the x axis. Right. Ah, okay. Right, right. I understand. N is not on the x-axis. N somehow there is some function of n. For example, one over n. Yeah. Right. Yes. Huh. The n values define the x-axis values close to zero, and that will get both sides of the parabola close to zero. Okay. Okay. I understand what you are trying to do. No, I understand what you're what you're trying to say. So, so in a sense, so let me sort of try and say the same thing in a, in a slightly different fashion. Part of the problem really seems to be the following: that you're trying to find an answer. So I think more or less everyone is trying to find a sequence a and given by a formula, right? So what's the attempt really from all the guesses so far? It is you're trying to find some formula which will do the trick, right? half power n minus half power n trying various combinations which will somehow produce a sequence which has that property that it doesn't decrease all the time. Now the key thing to remember is to sort of let go of that notion that sequences have to be actually given by formulas. A sequence at the end of the day is just a list of numbers, right? So it may not necessarily be defined only through formulae. What you could do is just the following. You take your favorite curve which does all those funny things you wanted to do. Suppose I just draw a continuous even curve like this. Just draw some random graph on the plane. Okay? So here's I'll, I'll tell you a way of manufacturing this sequence. Just draw some random graph on the plane, which sort of does a few bumps up and down. Okay? And if this is my, my curve, let's say it's it's some it's a graph of some function f of x. So I don't know, I've just drawn some random curve. Now how will I manufacture my sequence from here? Exactly. Just take this graph and you define your sequence as what's the first term? It's just the value of f at 1. What's the second term? It's the value of f at 2. Third term, value of f at 3, and so on. Now, because of the way you have chosen the graph that it keeps going up and down, the values of f at each integral point, at, at each integer, will have the same property. Right? It will go up initially or down, f of 1. So here's your sequence. So here's what I'm saying. For this particular curve that I have drawn, take a n to just be f of n. Define it like this. Okay. And remember, I'm not telling you what f is. F, if f is given by some nice formula, that will be good. But you don't need that to be the case. You can just draw any curve whatsoever and just say, oh well, let me read off the values that the function takes or this graph takes at x equal to one, x equal to two, x equal to three, and so on, and treat them as the terms of my sequence. If I did this, then what does this sequence do? Well, you know, f of 1 is bigger, so it decreases initially. a1 is bigger than a2, is bigger than a3, and then what happens? It decreases, then starts increasing for a while. Then decreases, starts increasing. Decreases, increase. Right? So you have manufactured a sequence which does that. Okay? It has both kinds of behavior. So the, one of the important things to remember is the sequence need not always be given by an explicit formula. It can be pretty much any list of numbers that you manufacture in any way. Okay? So here's an example which says that 
it's not necessarily the case that even though the limit is zero in that case, because the function I've chosen sort of goes towards zero, but it's not necessary that the sequence itself must decrease. You know, it doesn't need to be a uniform behavior. It not always decrease. It can do funny things in the middle, but eventually it must approach. Okay? So that is sort of the one thing to keep in mind with limit that it need not just approach in one way. It can sort of you know, go around in some sense. So the word around is actually one of the, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very flexible and powerful word which sort of is also very appropriate to this situation. So this aroundness is somehow important. Okay, I mean, I, I, I'll say a little bit more about this. Okay, so we have said the value of an should become very small, should approach zero. The terms are around zero. The graph should be close to the x-axis. So each of these is sort of a reasonable way of, of uh, thinking about it. So let, let me just erase this for now. It's a, it's a very good point to remember that a sequence need not actually decrease. So now let's apply this, this, these intuitive notions to you know, certain sequences. So the sequence I want is the following. So we've already said, so let, I'm going to apply this, this notion now. Uh, to various examples, limit as n goes to infinity of a. Uh, so let me define a n first. Uh, I shouldn't do it this way. A n is given by the formula one over n as n. So here n n is of course one, two, three, and so on. And what's the limit? So we already said this, right? Limit of the sequence one over n, one half, one third, one fourth, blah blah blah. That's just a zero, okay? And does that match with our uh, notion here? The value of a n becomes very, very small, right? Which is in some sense true. One over n is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. It's becoming closer and closer to zero. So the terms are all around zero. After a while, somehow the terms are small enough. Hmm. This is for the earlier sequence that keeps going up and down. One by two plus. Let me just write down. One by two plus two power n. Two power n. Yeah. Minus n square. Like this. Yes. Two power n minus n. Ah, achha. so it finally boils down to what two power n minus n square does. Yes. Right. So you're saying, in some sense, consider the function one by two plus. 2 power x minus x square. Think of this function, sort of draw its graph, and this graph should have the property that you want. So for example, at x equal to 0, this is at 3. Yeah? At x equal to 0, it's at 3. And then uh, what does it do? It initially decreases, I suppose, and then goes up. Ah, so the other way around. So it goes up and then goes down, right? Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So, like I said, eventually, you know, trying to cook up the formula is probably hard, but the basic idea is very simple. What you need is a function which will do what you want it to do, right? If you can write a formula for it, well and good. So maybe this, here's here's an example of a formula which will it will first go up and then go down. Okay. But in some sense, conceptually, all you want is just a function, to, you know, which has the correct characteristics, and then you pick its values. Okay. Okay, so let me revisit this example. The limit of this sequence is zero. That's fine. It's intuitive enough. So let me define another sequence. So here's example two. I want to say my sequence a n is given by sort of the following things. It's a one, so it's a case, case-wise definition. A n is one if n is a power of 10. If n is a power of 10, then I claim I want a n to be 1, and I want it to be 1 by n if n is not a power of 10. Not a power of 10. Okay, so maybe it's right there. So what does it mean if you write out the first few terms of this sequence? First term is 1, 
because it's not a power of 10, uh, half, one third, one by four, till I get to one by nine, it's the usual sequence one by n. So what's the next term? Now n is 10, right? The 10th term, I, it, it falls into this case, the 10th term is a one. Now then after that I go along as usual, one by 11, 12 till one by 99th. And then the hundredth term is a one, right? So you notice what I'm doing. I'm just taking the usual sequence one by n and every now and then, you know, sort of rarely in some sense, I take the 10th term, 100th term, 1000th term, 10,000th term and so on and I make all of them once instead of whatever value they were supposed to be, fine? So you're just tweaking a bunch of terms, sort of rarely just picking them here and there. Now I'm not, I'm not changing this uh, sequence in a, in a very gross way. I'm just doing some very, you know, I'm just, in some sense you'll, you, it feels like I'm just picking out very, very few terms and very far apart and just changing their values, okay? So what's the limit of this sequence as n goes to infinity? So here's my question. Question, limit a n as n goes to infinity. So the limit should be only one thing, right? You cannot say it's one or zero, plus minus one, those sorts of things you cannot say. Limit is only one thing. Or it does not exist, cannot be defined indeterminate, those are all okay. But as a number, it's only one or the other. It can't be both. Zero. So let me, so let's look at all ways of thinking about it. So zero, why do you think it's zero? Okay, the values are around zero. The values are trying to approach zero, but Every now and then they become a one, but somehow you're saying, okay, what if one fellow becomes one, the next guy comes very close to zero again, you know, sort of makes up for it. So every now and then there are a few bad terms, but you don't worry about the bad guys. The rest are, you know, trying to be good citizens, in some sense. They're trying to get to zero, right? So most of the terms are doing what you want them to do. That's sort of what you're saying. Okay, that's, that sounds reasonable. What are other, any, anyone dissents? Okay, why? Okay, right. most terms, let, let, let me just sort of write uh, justifications as well. Most terms are around zero. And uh, why is it one, you say, powers of 10? Powers of 10 become higher. What do you mean by that? 10 power n is very big. So you're saying 10 power n is, is much larger than n. But why, the, why does it affect the limit? The limit is after all supposed to be, you know? Limit does not exist. Limit does not exist. Okay, so, so one is probably not, right? Okay, so let me say does not exist. Why do you say it does not exist? Okay, we're not getting a unique value. Hmm. Right. Correct. Okay. Yes. Right. So you're saying, in some sense, when you approach from two different directions, it's going to two different values. But here, what, there are no two different directions, right? You're, there's only one direction, you can keep going down the sequence. So you keep going further and further to the right of the sequence. So you're saying, okay, it seems like there are two values. So there is either a one or it seems like a good number of terms. So most of the terms are going here. Limit means you're getting a unique limit. Yes, a unique value. 
Okay, it's not a you. Okay, fine. That's maybe one way of arguing. So you want to say it does not exist because it seems like you know there is zero. One one bunch is going to zero, but every now and then another bunch is going to a one. Yes. It's one, why? Add, what do you mean? If you add one, add one by n. If you add one? One by n always approaches to zero. Yes. So you always have one. So no, what do you mean by add one? Why are you adding ones to every term? If you sum them up, you will always get a Right, no, if you sum them up, yeah, fine, but you are you're not quite doing sums here. When you say sequence, you just mean just the terms themselves, right? Yeah. <coughs> Any other thoughts on what else, I mean, if it's one of, if you still think it's one of these, you can maybe still tell me what, what your thought process, what your explanation is. Because we are trying to arrive at the explanation as well. That's the other important thing. It's not just the answer. Any other reason why you think? Uh, ah. Okay. I, ah, I, I understand what you mean. Hmm. So you are ah, that was what you were trying to say earlier. Okay, okay, now I understand. So that I'll paraphrase you. Tell me whether it's okay. No, no, I understand. I, we are just trying to write out intuition, isn't it? So you're saying, see, it seems like there are two possible candidates. There is a zero to which many of the terms go. But there is also another option, which is one, to which some other terms go. But your argument is that as n becomes larger and larger, many more terms go towards one than how many terms go towards zero, right? This is what you're saying. There are two candidates, but one guy has more supporters. Is that reasonable? That's sort of what you mean, right? Many more fellows are approaching the candidate one than the, than the other fellow, than zero. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if that is, uh, it's true that there are many more values of n approaching 1, but nevertheless, let's write out the, the thought process there. 1, because you seem to say, uh, so basically your reasoning is there are two candidates, zero and 1, but it seems like, so one part of the sequence is going towards zero, the other part of the sequence is going towards one, but a larger part of the sequence is going towards one. That's what you say, right? So uh, many more terms go towards one than towards zero. Right? Okay. Fine. Any other? Okay. So, so we'll come back to this. So you can already see that. Yes. Right. Yes. Correct. Okay. So would you say it's zero then? Yeah. Okay, same reason you could give for the other thing also. That's fine. That's that's what is already been done, right? See, these are both the same sort of reason. This, you're saying zero is more popular than one. Many more terms like zero than they like one. This is the other option. You sort of seem to feel that one is more popular. Many more terms are going towards one. Limit is 0.5, okay, that's certainly a, okay, why average? So usually for want of better answers, this is what we do, right? So when there are many different choices, we say, oh, let's not give it to any one guy, we'll just give it to, you know, the average, yeah. Sure, if you want to think about it that way. I mean, at the end of the day, this is coming from the fact that you want only one limit. Right? That's what you're, you're solving the problem. There seem to be two candidates, but I only want one answer, so what do you do? Well, average is usually how you break the deadlock on those. But the example is the difference between 0 and 1 is wider and wider. So, if you not go near to 1, if you are at the point where you are somewhere very, very close to 0 or 
right? So in some sense, 0.5 is the worst possible answer you can get because no term is going to go anywhere near it. If you said 0 or 1, at least they both have supporters. Right? 0.5 has nobody in its party, essentially. Okay. So fine. So let's let's revisit this. So one of the things that so I'm putting this down to mostly say the following that sequences which are defined by formulas are often, you know, they are deceptive in terms of this notion of limit because you are, a, a, a formula already implies a certain amount of regularity. I mean, it's you know, it's given by some nice function of x in which instead of x you are putting n's. You are just choosing different values of natural numbers. And then somehow the behavior of the function as x goes to infinity is reflected in what the sequence does as n goes to infinity. It's really only when you start manufacturing these sort of hotspot sequences, you know, they do one thing here, something else there and so on. That's when the, you can really clarify what the notion of limit means, okay? So here it seems like there's more than one candidate. Okay, now let me take another example. So we'll, we'll come back and see what. No, I'm, 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 I'm going to revisit it. At the moment, I'm, I'm happy with all these answers. We'll just see which one really fits the bill. Okay, these, all of these seem to be ways of thinking about it. That's all I, I want to point out at the moment. So we'll, we'll come back to what, what the formal definition needs to be. So here's uh, question number two. So example three maybe. An is defined as follows. It's one by n, the same thing as before, one by n if n is not a power of 10. Okay, same as before, n not not a power of 10 and it's 1 by n times some very large number. Let's multiply it by 1 billion, 10 power 9, right? That's 1 billion if n is a power of 10. Okay, so I'm not quite doing the earlier one. See, I'm still tweaking the same terms. I'm taking the sequence 1 over n, and here's what I want to do now in the second example. I want to change the 10th term, 100th term, 1000th term, and so on, but the way I'm changing them is different. Earlier, I made all those 1, right? I made all of them 1, but now I'm still going to keep the, their value that they had, 1 by n, but I'm going to sort of multiply them. I'm going to boost all of them up by a factor of 1 billion. Okay, so for example, what will my terms look like? So I'll, I have one half, one third, and so on. I'll keep going along. Suddenly, the tenth term becomes, I don't know, one by ten of one billion, right? It's ten power eight. So this guy is huge. And then I keep going along, and then hundredth term, this fellow was a paltry one over ninety-nine, and this guy is a ten power seven, and so on. Right? So you see what's happening. The same set of terms, I pick these rare terms, 10 hundredth, 10,000th ten term, and I boost them up by some factor. That factor is immaterial. I just chose a billion for fun, but you can pick any number k. Okay? Take any number k and boost it up by that, that constant factor. So this sort of mixed sequence, where some of the terms are boosted up by a constant, what do you think is its limit? What's limit of this sequence? Why? One? Why? So let's write out various answers. So why is it zero? Because? Why? Okay. So maybe on object you have to go up to infinity. The value is going close to zero. Okay. So if it was around zero or near to zero, that means k power infinity. Fine. Okay. Any other <coughs> explanation? You had you had something to say, sir? Huh? Zero. Okay. For the same reason? 
So one one option is zero. Uh, you were saying one, why? Yes, it'll become that becomes one. That's only one term, right? So the ninth term. So somewhere along the way, you're saying there'll be a ten power zero. That term is a one. Agreed. But what about the terms after it? See, sequence means limit as I keep going further and further and further and to the right, right? One single term cannot affect the fate of a sequence. It's what happens eventually. It's somehow all of them together have to tell you what the limit is. So, what? No limit? Does not exist, okay. So, why do you say it does not exist? It's random, okay. So in the middle, these are all boosted up, right? Okay, but, but sort of notice what's, how it's boosted up, right? See, this is 10 power eight. Let's see the, what happens to the boosted up terms. This fellow is 10 power eight, next term is 10 power seven, next term is 10 power six, 10 power five, four, three, two, one, 10 power zero, which is a one. Then what happens beyond that? One by ten, right? What do you mean by define an interval? No, what do you mean by define an interval? Ah, you mean I should pick a certain set of terms and worry about what the limits are there. No, limit means what happens as I go, f you know, as much to the right of the sequence as I can. That's really what limit should mean, right? So you're saying what you should take maybe the first billion terms or the first three billion terms and then study what happens there. No, you shouldn't prefix a limit. I mean, maybe the first three billion terms are all garbage, right? It could be all zeros for you know, maybe you were taking data from an experiment and first 3,000 things, your thing was not even on and you got a zero. And then you switched on, you know, you started getting correct answers from three, you know, three billion and one term. So it's possible that when you have a sequence, any, the first finite set of terms might, uh, might have just been some transient wrong, wrong values or garbage values or whatever. So it's only what happens eventually that you should worry about. Okay, so notice one thing, this is, there is slightly more weight here to the claim that it is zero because even though you are boosting up a bunch of terms, the boosted up terms are nevertheless going to zero, right? Because they are 10 power eight, seven, six, five, four, like you're saying three, two, one, then one by 10, one by 100, one by 1000 and so on, okay? So because of the boost, what happens is they go to zero a little afterwards then your usual sequence one by n. So imagine here's a graph, here's the sequence one by n. This is just how it would have been if I had not boosted a bunch of terms up. Now, what, what about the, the fellows which are boosted up? So imagine the 10th term goes up here. You know, the 100th term, it goes up somewhere. 1000th term goes up and so on. So imagine it's like there are two graphs sort of spliced between each other. There's one usual one by n, out of which there are some holes. 10, 100,000 are gone, and those guys, they sort of form their own behavior. But that behavior is also similar. 10th term is, like I said, this is 10 power eight, you know, the next guy is 10 power seven, and so on. So they, they all lie on the curve, you know, 10 power nine divided by x, if you wish. So they also lie on a curve of the form one by x, but rather one by x times some constant, okay? So that curve also goes to zero. It will take much longer to go to zero, that's all. But eventually, you're only worried about what happens at the end, right? So the claim is at the end, this sequence also goes to zero, okay? So here, zero is, is actually, you know, there, there is, you, you, you can actually make a credible argument for why it is a zero. So here, the answer is in fact zero. Okay, so maybe it's, it's time to make a precise definition which sort of captures you know, some of these things. And we'll see using the definition why certain things have limits and others don't have limits.
So here's sort of the precise definition of the limit of a sequence. So notice at least one thing I hope is clear that if you don't have a precise definition, if you just have terms, you know, like what we were doing here, it approaches, it is around and so on, then each of these sorts of um, examples will cause great confusion. It will not be clear how to apply the definition. Does it really approach? What does it mean to approach? Like in the first example, most of them are in fact approaching 0, right? Now and then there are a few bad guys, so why does that matter? It is not clear, should we take them into account, should we throw them out? Not clear. Again here, you know, how do you argue that the limit is in fact 0? It is true that, okay, the boosted up guys also come to 0, but they take much, much longer to come to 0. So is that, is that valid? Is that allowed? Am I, you know, am I justified in claiming the limit is 0? And so on. So it will bring forth, uh, you know, very serious questions about what the limit really is, whether it exists and so on. If you only work with these um, more heuristic definitions or intuitive definitions. So what you need is a precise definition which you can just apply per se to a given situation and which will tell you whether or not the limit is what you claim it is, okay? So the need for a precise definition stems by looking at examples like these. So here is the, the definition. We say that the limit, so let, let me say let A n be a sequence of numbers, let A 1, A 2, A 3 be a sequence of real numbers. We say that the limit of the sequence A n is a, a, a real number A. So let A also be some real number, so let A also be a real number. We say that the sequence A n has limit A if the following is true. Okay, so what is true? So here is what we want. So let me draw a picture for this. So imagine here is the real line, here is the number A which I am claiming is the limit, right? For example, in this case here, for this sequence I am claiming that 0 is its limit, right? So what does that mean? So here is the, here is the precise definition, the following is true. So here is the aroundness sort of thing. So pick any neighborhood of A, okay? Given any neighborhood of A, so what do I mean by a neighborhood? So let me read my sentence again. Let A i's be a sequence of real numbers. We say that the limit of A n is A if the following is true. Given any neighborhood, by neighborhood I mean any open interval, okay, around the point A. So let me give this open interval a name. Just call it J. Given an open interval J, around A, which means it contains the point A, but it can be anything. I mean on the left side, I am not saying it is symmetrical. It can be long here, short there, very, very small on both sides, anything. I give you any open interval, so I think of that as some neighborhood of A. Then what do I want for if the limit is A? It means that given an open interval A, I can find there exists a natural number n such that all terms of the sequence from the nth term onwards, okay, this capital N, such that all A n's, uh, such that for all terms from the nth term onwards, the nth term a n of the sequence belongs to this neighborhood j. Okay. So let me parse this statement again. It is not very easy the first time you see it. So what do I want? 
I am claiming if you tell me that the limit is A, then the following must be true. What should be true? I will give you any neighborhood of that limiting point. Okay, I will give you any neighborhood J. I can make it as small as I please or you know, as large as I please. I would often want it to make it very, very small. I will make it, I will take any neighborhood whatsoever. Then here is what should happen. I should be able to find some natural number n such that the sequence, the terms of the sequence from the nth term onwards, after the nth term, all terms of the sequence must lie inside this neighborhood. So this is what my sequence, the, here are the terms of the sequence that I would want. Say this is the nth term A capital N. So maybe the next term is this A N plus 1 capital N plus 2th term and so on. Whatever they are, they are scattered inside that neighborhood. They should not be outside the neighborhood. Do you know the neighborhood of the sequence? Sorry, what? No, no, no. What do you mean by neighborhood of the sequence? No, I am just saying uh, by neighborhood, I am just meaning any open interval around that point. That is what I mean by neighborhood. Okay? So I am saying if I give any open interval around that point, you should be able to give me a natural number n such that from the nth term onwards, all terms of the sequence are confined within that neighborhood. Okay? So let us use this definition. If this is true, then you say that the limit is A. Fine? This is the precise formal definition of a limit. Now let us actually apply it to these cases. So it's it becomes clearer if we see it in action. So let me apply it to, you know, to, to each of these, these guys. Um, okay, I guess I'll have to erase and come back to this. So let me, let me first apply to this, the sequence. Let's take the sequence 1 by n. I claim that the limit is 0, right? So let's prove this formally using this precise definition. How do you know the limit is 0? What do I need to prove, therefore? So I claim the limit of the sequence is 0. Proof, here is formal proof. What do we need to show? I should take any open interval around 0. So let 0 be my value. So let me define A, the limit to be 0, right? So that is, so that I can use the definition here. Given any neighborhood, so let me take any neighborhood. So let J be any neighborhood of 0. By neighborhood, I said any open interval around 0. Okay, take an open interval. What does an open interval look like? So if 0 is my, my middle point, what do I mean by an open interval containing 0? It should look like this, right? So what is this? This endpoint is something, we call it C this endpoint is D, right? And what are C and D? C is a negative number, D has to be a positive number, right? Only then it is an open interval which contains 0. So let us pick any J, let J be any open interval around 0. In other words, let me assume I am given this, J is C D, I am given C negative D positive. Okay. Now what do I want to produce? This is given. In order to show that this limit is 0, I need to produce the following. For this j, I need to produce a natural number n. This num n will depend on j. Okay? But what do we need my capital N to satisfy? All terms from the nth term onwards have to lie within this open interval. Okay? So what do we need to do? Need to find some value n, any, any one value is enough to find capital N such that with the property all terms a n, a n plus 1, a n plus 2 and so on, all these terms lie inside this interval. They belong to the interval C D. This is what I want to do. So how do you produce this? What is the requirement that I need to, to satisfy? My n has to be such that 
what are these terms a n is in other words so i e i want 1 by n should be in c d the next fellow 1 by n plus 1 should also be in c d and so on 1 by n plus 2 should also be in c d every subsequent term should be confined within that interval ok. So, how do I find n is there a value of n which will do the job what Archimedean property huh. Huh. ok Ah, ok, 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 fine, you are saying uh, that is the Archimedean property, I see, ok, formally, but yes, that is exactly what you want to do. So, observe, what do we need? 1 by n is already a positive number, so c is negative, so I do not need to worry about that. I just need to ensure that 1 by n, uh, 1 by n is bigger than 0, I need to ensure 1 by n is smaller than d, that is all, right. If 1 by n is smaller than d, it will lie in that interval, that is it. So, this condition that 1 by n belongs to c d means in other words, I just need to ensure 1 by n is less than d, 1 by n plus 1 is less than d, 1 by n plus 2 is less than d and so on. But do I need to check every one of them? If I do the first fellow, everything else is okay? Yes, if 1 by n is less than d, then all these fellows are even smaller, right? 1 by n plus 1 is even smaller than 1 by n. The next guy is even smaller and so on. So, here it is decreasing, so we can use that to our advantage. So, what do we need? No need to worry about the other other fellows. Only this fellow is all I need. I need to find n for which 1 by n is smaller than the given number d. Is there such a value of n? Yeah. What is n? I mean, there is always a rational number very, very close to 0, right? Uh, something of the form 1 by n. Or another way is, what does this condition mean? n is greater than 1 by d. Right, d is some given number. Now, observe, therefore, all I want is this n should satisfy the property that it is any natural number bigger than 1 by d. So, I can pick any one of them. There are many natural numbers bigger than 1 by d, infinitely many of them. I can pick any one of them, ok. So, take n. So, therefore, finally, take n. Uh, we have managed to find our value of n. Take n to be what shall we do? Take uh, any natural number, uh, let me write it like this. You pick your favorite natural number, which is bigger than 1 by d. That is the only condition. Okay. So, is this fine? The way we have executed the definition. The point here is the definition says the you know the, the flow of the logic is the following. Usually when you say that the limit of a sequence is 1 over n, what are you mentally doing? You are running you know you are sort of running your mind through the terms of the sequence. So, sort of a dynamic approach you are saying oh what is happening, what is happening to my sequence you know as I keep moving further. So, you move along the sequence mentally and see what happens to its terms right that is the psychological way of doing it. Now, the precise definition is sort of the opposite, ok. The psychologically appropriate way of doing it is not good, you know, from a precise point of view. It will trip you up when the uh, applications, you know, the uh, sequences get complicated. Instead, we settle for a precise definition, which is sort of the opposite end. So, what is this? This is not formulated dynamically. You do not run your mind through the terms of the sequence and see what is happening as you go along. Instead, you say, well, you are claiming that the limit is a, then prove it to me, ok. How? Here is the thing, if you tell me that the limit is 0, then I will set you a challenge. I will give you an interval around the your candidate. If you claim the limit is 0, I will give you a challenge. Here is my interval around that point, ok. And I can make the interval very, 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 very small, right. For example, in this thing that I did, I will say, well, you want, you, you claim the limit is 0, then try the following. Let me take c to be 0 point minus 0 point 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 and d to be plus 0 point whatever, these many 0 0 0 0 0 1, right. I can pick an extremely tiny interval and I will tell you, here is my challenge. If 
find a value of n such that all terms of your sequence from the nth term, term onwards are confined to this interval that I, I have given you. Okay? So, it, it is now formulated as a challenge response kind of, of definition. It is not a dynamical thing where you just imagine what happens as a sequence goes along. It is now a challenge response. I should give you a challenge and you should respond. Yes, why? You should, ah, I see what you mean. Yes, 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 correct. Yes, absolutely, you are right. So, yes, it makes perfect sense. So, that is, that is a very, very important point in this. Observe the earlier dynamical thought process where you are running your mind through the terms, you are sort of hopefully converging to some candidate, right? You are, you are, you can get a candidate just by imagining what is happening to the terms as you go along. Here, this is not designed to find a candidate, but it is designed to check once a candidate is produced, this approach will check whether that is in fact the correct answer. Okay? So, that is sort of why it is you know formulated in this challenge response thing. Once you give me a candidate A, I will say I will give you a challenge which cons consists of an interval around your candidate A. I will give you a neighborhood of A and then you must produce this capital N. Right? But A itself is not known by this method. It only checks whether A is the limit or not, absolutely. So, the point is you can't completely get rid of the other way of doing things, right? This, this dynamical approach is psychologically better, is also useful to find a, a candidate or say some candidates. Now here, so let us let's just do the next one. So here we have managed to find a value of n which proves that in fact this is the limit. Now let us do the same thing to that 1 billion example. Suppose I give you that as my, you know, that is the sequence and I claim that the limit of the sequence is 0. Right? Let us prove it using this precise definition of limit. I claim limit of a n as n tends to infinity is 0. So, let us prove, proof. So, how should we prove this? Since I am telling you that this is the limit, right? And how will I prove it to you? I will ask you to challenge me, right? So, you have to now challenge me by giving me some neighborhood around 0, okay? So, what neighborhood? Well, pick anything. So, you, you have given me a neighborhood. So, let j be a neighborhood around 0. So, that is sa same thing c d uh, be a so neighborhood is often just shorthand for open interval neighborhood of 0. So, again same thing c therefore is negative d is positive right. So, that is the challenge and how should I respond? I should find a value of n, I will keep the precise definition. So, let me find a value of n need to find n such that a n a n plus 1 dot 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 everybody belongs to that sequence C. And as before, all these terms are anyway positive terms in that example. So, I can forget about C. C is anyway a negative number. So, I just want to ensure that all these terms are smaller than D. That is all I want. That is, I want A n to be smaller than D, A n plus 1 to be smaller than D and so on. Right? As I said, D can be very, very small 0 0.00000000001 for example. That is my D but you should still find a capital N for which that is true. One more time, uh, one that is if it is 1 by N. So, remember I have changed my sequence. So, I am now doing this one, sorry. Right? Earlier I did that, right? 1 by N was my sequence. Then finding capital N is easy. I will just take any number bigger than 1 by D, any natural number bigger than 1 by D. But now, my sequence is changed. Most of the time it is 1 by n, but there are a few fellows which have been boosted up. Right? But still I claim the limit is 0. Okay? I claim even with this boosted sequences, boosted fellows in the middle, I can still find a capital N such that all terms of the sequence will be confined within C D. 
this confinement is what I want, I can ensure that happens to every one of these terms. Okay? How do you do it? Okay? So where comes the problem? So let's see. This a n, so let me write out the sort of the, so what is a n likely to be? So let's say we, we were in the, the part of the sequence that was not boosted. So this is the original sequence. Suppose a n is 1 by n, 1 by n plus 1, 1 by n plus 2. So all these, this is like the earlier one. For this to be true, I just need to choose n to be greater than 1 by d, right? And so on. Now the point is, somewhere along the way, there is a boost, right? So this fellow, instead of being 1 by, say, n plus some k down the way, it is that into 10 power 9. Right? Somewhere down the line, there is a fellow which has been boosted up. Now, that boosted guy, I should ensure that that is also less than d. Right? My, my challenge says, I need to ensure that this term is also less than d. Okay. So once one term is boosted, the next guy is an ordinary term. He's a usual flow, 1 over something. That is less than d, that, that's OK. Because if I ensure 1 by n is less than d, every subsequent one by th fellow term of the form 1 by n, that will be less than d. But it's only the boosts that I'm worried about. How will I ensure, if I ensure 1 by n is less than d, these fellows will not be less than d necessarily, right? The boosted guys might be bigger. So how do I choose n so that every subsequent term, whether or not it is boosted, every subsequent term is less than d? OK, excellent. So, so here's the idea. See, if this is 1 by n, then, you know, if I choose n greater than 1 by d, it will work. But instead of that, you, you sort of, you know, overcompensate. Instead of choosing 1 by n less than d, you pretend for a moment, what if this were a power of 10? What if this term were boosted up, right? The very first term were boosted up, it looked like 10 power 9 by, by n, right? Now, you just choose n such that that itself is less than d. Then, every subsequent term, whether or not it is boosted up, those terms will all become less than d, okay? So, uh, meaning it's, it's a lot of words when I just say it like this, but if you just write it out, so here's what I really want to do. So, uh, how do I produce n? So, the idea is the following. Choose n as follows. So, some amount of cleverness is required here. Choose n as follows, such that n satisfies the following property. Think 10 power 9 by n should be less than d. Okay. Choose n like this, such that not 1 by n less than d, but in fact 10 power 9 by n. Think of a boosted version of 1 by n. That itself is less than d. In other words, What's the choice of n here? n should be bigger than 10 power 9 by d. So choose any natural number bigger than 10 power 9 by d. Okay, so n equals any natural number bigger than 10 power 9 by d. If you do this, then it now remains to check that every one of the terms after it will also be less than d. Okay. Now suppose n satisfies this property, now let us check the following. Now I need to check that a n will be less than d for every subsequent n. Right? How do I check every subsequent term is less than d? Well, what can a n look like? There is only one of two possibilities. Either it is a boosted term or a non-boosted term. Right? If it is a boosted term, it looks like 10 power 9 by n. If it's not a boosted term, it looks like 1 by n. It's only these two possibilities, right? Now, if, if it is boosted or not boosted, so observe the boosted value is much bigger than the non-boosted value, right? I claim even the boosted value itself is, is smaller than d. Okay, now observe, I need to check a n less than d for all n. Observe 10 power 9 by n is in fact smaller than 10 power 9 by capital N because you know n is bigger than capital n so this is of course less than d okay so what we have managed to do is again to find a value of capital n and what value of capital n is it now it's 
you pick a natural number which is bigger than 1 billion over D. Right? Earlier, I needed, needed to only pick a number which is bigger than 1 by D. Now, I need to go much, much larger. I need to pick 1 billion by D, but still it is some finite number. I don't care. I just pick some n such that beyond that stage, all terms belong. Okay? So, you know, so I understand this is almost certainly very confusing. So, but please do take a look at, uh, you know, look at it again at home and try to work out this, this logic to prove that this boosted sequence in fact has a limit. Okay? And uh, I'm, I'm, it's time to stop, but the other example that I had with ones in the middle, right, where instead of boosting those terms were ones, again there prove that the limit is, is it's not zero or one. Okay? So try proving that the limit there is neither zero nor one. Okay? So this, this last part I will take up again tomorrow morning. Um, so I, I'm, tomorrow I'm actually supposed to talk about vectors and coordinate geometry. It was my original plan, but I still have lots more to say about limits and calculus. So maybe I'll, I'll continue this for a little while tomorrow and then move on towards uh, vectors and so on. Okay? So something to think about for today is uh, try, try that problem with the one in the middle and prove that using the formal definition of the limit that the limit is not zero, it is not one. Okay, so which brings us to your point, you can only check things like that. The limit cannot be a given candidate. You check it's not zero, check it's not one. Because in each case, you will be unable to produce this value of n. You will be unable to respond to the challenge. That's how you, you must prove it formally. Uh, yes, that's the answer, correct. The limit doesn't exist. That's what we'll eventually prove. Not just zero, one, any value a, you cannot get it to, you can't find a value of n there. Where? Uh, yes, yeah, that's one way of saying it. Yes, absolutely, correct. It should be bounded at the very least. Yeah. I mean, bounded close to the candidate limit. Okay. So, any questions? Okay. If not, we'll stop.